Okay, so welcome back to the channel and in today's video, we have a reaction video, which is very rare. I barely make reaction videos, but someone on Instagram called Off Neil actually recommended a really good documentary from the 90s that's on YouTube. And I'll leave the full link to this documentary in the description below. So if you wanna watch the full video, definitely click the link in my description because I'm only really reacting to a few key points in this documentary. And this documentary is on the power of press um, in the fashion industry. So I thought it would be really good to react to because a lot of the things that they did say in this documentary, I've been saying for years. And I haven't been able to find the full documentary because the one on YouTube is like 30 minutes long. Um, so if anyone has a link or knows where I can find like the full documentary, I would really love uh, to see it. Um, so let's get straight into the reaction. As the media prepares to play its part as the powerful conduit between designer and public, as hundreds of journalists set off to write the 2,500 pages of copy written every season, did the PR get it right? Were the right people sitting in the right seats? And in an industry where a bright idea can mean a million sales and a couple of bad ideas bankruptcy, will they say the right things? If everyone could agree on a joint fashion statement, journalists, buyers, designers, and customers, then the wheels of the industry would turn smoothly. But they don't. Taste is relative. Nobody knows what's nice or not. It's all a matter of opinion. I totally agree with what was just said, and that's why I've made a video that's titled, There is no such thing as a greatest designer of all time. Because every great designer we know is great for different reasons. So how do you bring all those different reasons side by side and objectively say, this design is better than that design is better than that legend. Um, so I really don't like it when people do that. Fashion is very, very, very subjective. So many different people have many different opinions and it's just based on opinions, personal taste and your experiences as to whether it connects with you naturally. So I think that's the same thing in terms of fashion. I think there's many different ways you can tackle fashion journalism. There's a way where you can just explain the references, which is what like I try to do, a lot of people do, which is very good because that's not subjective, that's objective. If someone says they were inspired by this, then you can talk about the inspiration. But in terms of saying whether you liked it or it was good or bad, that's always going to be subjective. And that's why I don't know why designers or people at large get really offended when people give negative reviews because at the end of the day, it's a personal opinion, um, so yeah. Wherever their seat is finally located in the press block, each journalist sees a collection from a fixed point of view, in every sense of the word, fixed by their employers, from newspapers, quality and tabloid on the one hand, to magazines, glossy and trade on the other. Each is representative of a particular constituency with specific objectives. But however different the publications may be, according to Michael Gross of New York Magazine, there are but two types of fashion journalists, reporters and cheerleaders. Cheerleaders tend not to write nasty things. Cheerleaders tend, in many cases, not to write the truth. My first season in Paris, I had to go backstage at a show where I hated the collection. And I walked backstage and bang, face to face with Martine Sidmont. And out of my mouth came one of the worst things that you could possibly say when she asked me what I thought of the collection. I said it was interesting. Oh, God, forgive me for that. Um, and she, her face fell, and I knew I had made a mistake. So I went to one of the great old dragon ladies of the fashion press, whose name I won't tell you, and I said, what do you do in a case like that? And she said, there is always something to like, even if it's a shoe. And this is what many fashion writers do, is they look for that shoe because they're not going to criticize that dear designer who invites them to dinner, places them at their right at dinner, gives them clothes at wholesale, at cost, at discount, for free, um, sucks up to them backstage, makes them feel important. Okay, so to me personally, if a journalist sells out, they lose all credibility. Now, selling out does not mean receiving items from a brand or press. Selling out means you receiving those items influences your opinion. So I've always said on this channel, 
If Prada wants to send me clothes, you can send me clothes. But the second I don't like a collection, I'm going to say it. And if you don't like that, then don't send me clothes in the first place type of thing. And I feel like the death of a lot of fashion journalism has been how commercialized it's become. And just going off what this guy said about um, people being cheerleaders, this is why when I read a review on a show, I just like to read something critical, whether it's negative or positive. I just like to read an educated, intelligent opinion. I don't want to see, which is what I'd see in loads of magazines, they're like, it featured baby blue skirts and red tops. And it's like, okay, so you've not said it's positive or negative. You've not been critical about anything. You haven't talked about the references. This is a waste of paper. It's a waste of text. The type of journalists that write like that, the only reason they do that is because they probably have a brand, the magazine probably has a brand deal with that magazine. So the magazine has to write about um, the collection. And of course it can't be negative. And most of the time, these journalists just aren't really that critical anyway. So it's obviously not going to mean much because they're not really going to talk about the references because, well, that's too much work to go and seek out all that stuff um, for a lot of these journalists. And it's quite sad that some journalists value um, their place on a certain seat or going to dinner with certain designers over their journalistic integrity. For me personally, if you want to be a journalist, there's there's certain professions that come with certain things. So if you're going to be friends with a designer, you have to let them know that when it's, when it's time to be critical, you need to be critical. Because otherwise, sometimes I feel like in some friendships, because of the friendship, journalists are just not critical about them at all. And it's just like, as a policeman, if you're a policeman, you're basically accepting the fact that at some point, your life could possibly be in danger. And one of the risks of you know, being a policeman is that you could get killed, I don't know, chasing a criminal or whatever. It's the same thing as a journalist, obviously on a way less dangerous level, but you should already accept the fact that in pursuit of being critical, you might mess up some relationships you have with people or you might piss people off. That is kind of, to me personally, what comes with being a journalist. And if you're not ready to be that, then maybe you shouldn't be a journalist. Maybe journalism isn't the industry for you. That stuff actually pisses me off that People aren't critical because they want to go to dinner with Karl Lagerfeld or they want to, I don't know, get free Prada. Like, journalism's not the right job for you. Any journalist watching this that does that, think about your life. Honestly, you're not in the right profession. It's a very press-conscious profession, as you very well know. Uh, and there's a lot of money invested in lobbying the press of all kinds, magazines, newspapers, television. I mean, realize these are reporters working on reporter salaries, dealing with egomaniacal millionaires. And so pleasing these egomaniacal millionaires becomes very, very, very important to them. I don't care whether I eat dinner with these people. Really respect this guy because he just said he doesn't care if he eats dinner with these people. And I feel like that's the mindset that every journalist should have. It's all about just sharing your opinions, whether positive or negative, but just be true to yourself but also be critical. So what some journalists do that I don't like is they'll be like, it's garbage, it's trash. And they feel like, because I don't know, they work for Vogue, their voice has authority. But to me, I'm just like, you haven't actually said anything. You just said it's bad. You didn't explain to me why you think it's bad. You weren't critical in any way. There's nothing intelligent about what you said. You just said it's bad. Like, so what am I supposed to take away from that? And that's another thing that a lot of journalists do that is quite annoying. Just justify your opinions. It's just like anything in any academic paper, in any subject, if you make a point, you have to back up the point with facts. So if you make an opinion that you don't like something, there has to be something that backs up that opinion to even have that opinion in the first place. Otherwise, how did you arise to that opinion? And it just seems like in the fashion industry of today, a lot of fashion journalists, they've kind of lost their way. They've kind of forgotten what journalism is supposed to be. And that's why my personal dream job is to work for a lot of magazines because I feel like the fashion industry right now is so fake and we need to just dismantle how things are being written and how the fashion journalism is going and bring it back to when things were actually critical and analytical.
There are people around designers, some of whom are smart and some of whom aren't smart. And every journalist has been threatened in one time or another by someone who says, I'm going to cancel my advertising if you don't do this. I mean, there is a lot of bribery that goes on. I see the 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 will carry a bag arriving at my hotel in Paris, not addressed to me, addressed to everybody else, you know, and I sort of peep into them and think, oh, that looks, that looks like a nice jacket. But that's, you know, they've... they've They've bought that space, basically, if they're going to give them a free coat. I'd love to have lots of roses, but that's sadly not true. I've actually talked about this in the past, in many past videos, actually, that um, a lot of people, if they get a negative review from a magazine, threaten, we're going to pull our millions from your magazine if you don't change this opinion. And that's why I feel like this relationship between magazines and fashion brands is so toxic that the consumers don't get anything critical or don't get good, true journalism. And that's why I always suggest that people read more like newspapers because they don't rely on um, advertisement money from places like, I don't know, fashion brands. Because newspapers, they have brand deals from a multitude of different corporations. So you tend to see uh, more genuine and unique opinions uh, through things like the Evening Standard or the Washington Post or, you know, the London Times and New York Times, things like that. As legendary for the confidence of her opinions as her cottage loaf hairdo by Alexandre de Paris, Susie Menkes files 1,500 words daily in the heat of the collections, so is read avidly by designers, buyers, a small but high-spending readership from Beirut to Bangkok, and her colleagues. Her copy comes out in the morning and a lot of people I know will read her copy and if she says Carl was fabulous even people I've spoken to the night before who said oh god what was that skirt will then write Carl was fabulous and I'm, I don't understand that attitude they won't stick their necks out she is so powerful and so well regarded that they think well she must be right they don't trust their own instincts on clothes she can say whatever she wants because well, she is Susie Menkes okay so I have so much to say about this it's, it's unbelievable um, you guys would be so surprised how so in my opinion, there's two types of fashion journalists. There's people like me who I'm just really passionate about this stuff. It's why I made this YouTube channel. I just wanted to be, just get my opinion out there. And I really love um, what designers do and the history of fashion and all that sort of stuff. So I seek out all the information and it really fascinates me. There's another type of fashion journalist that I feel like when they went to school, they were kind of just like, mm, I kind of like fashion, I think I like fashion, and I like to write, so I'm going to study fashion journalism. And then they graduate with a fashion journalism degree, and now they work in fashion. And so they're not invested in it or interested in it enough. To them, it's just another job. For them to actually seek out information or to really, really, really learn about fashion. And for this reason, these people don't really have critical opinions and can never form critical opinions because they're so, not uneducated, more, the word is their lack of interest has limited how much knowledge they have gone to seek, essentially. And that's why when Susie Menke says something, these journalists blindly just copy what she says without even using their brains and actually coming up with their own personal opinion. I think it's also quite interesting because Susie Menke, of course, is one of my favorite fashion critics of all time. But I am also very aware that it was kind of like the industry allowed her to be critical. Like what Karl Lagerfeld just said, Susie Menkes can say what she wants because it's Susie Menkes. I feel like it reminds me of like going to fashion school and my friends that have gone to fashion school and study fashion design, how tutors are, where if a tutor likes you, you could make, I don't know, anything and they'll say it's good. But if a tutor doesn't like you, they'll just decide not to understand the references in your collection and just say it's not as good, for example. So same thing, in fashion, people like to pick and choose who they like and who they don't like. And that's why a person like Susie Menkes, luckily, she was, you know, picked by the industry essentially to be the person who's allowed um, to give her critical thoughts without any ramifications, which is interesting. And of course, fashion is very elitist and very racist. Obviously, it's improving on the racism front. And elitism, pff, well, that's a discussion for another day. But I mean, a tall black kid like me, if I'm giving my critical opinion, people probably think, who the hell is this black kid who thinks he can 
give his opinion. Who does he think he is? So I am very aware that the industry definitely pick and choose who they like and who they don't and who's allowed to give critical thoughts and who isn't. Regardless of what the industry likes or doesn't like, I'm on YouTube, I'm not, I don't write for Vogue, so I can always give my true opinion. So sorry if it pisses anyone off, that, that's your business. Mr. Fairchild would wipe certain designers off the face of the earth and then claim he had nothing to do with it and say that it was his editors or his writers. Or Louise J. Esterhazy, women's wear's bitchy socialite gossip columnist who's rumored to be Mr. Fairchild himself. Very light colored cream. Fairchild was said to strike fear. Uh, I like it, it's too bad it's white into the hearts of the great couturiers. Yves Saint Laurent and Mr. Fairchild have had their share of pannings, bannings and butterings up. But when Mr. Fairchild loves a collection, everyone knows about it. So basically they're talking about John Fairchild, um, Mr. Fairchild. Um, he was the head of magazines like Women's Wear Daily and W Magazine. And he was basically talking about how if Mr. Fairchild doesn't like you, he can destroy your name um, in his magazines and kind of almost dismantle your business, which is insane that one person has that amount of power. I find it crazy how if one person does not like your work, that they have the power to just, make your work most people not like your work i feel like that's crazy and i hope no one still has that power maybe people like anna winter if she just says publicly all the time that she doesn't like a certain designer i guess they won't have a good time in the industry i guess um, but that's that's insane and that goes back to the point i made earlier about fashion picks and chooses who is uh who they like and who they don't like which i absolutely hate um for me, this goes back to once again, I think people are in fashion for the wrong reasons. People are in it for the glitz and glamour. And people are just not really passionate about fashion. They're not really, they don't care about the clothes. They just want to be cool and go to all these parties. For me personally, I don't really care about all that stuff. It's all mundane to me. I care about the clothes and the designers. And I could care less about who I like personally or not. I'm focusing on the work. Like, so I, I don't see why I would just not like a certain designer. Like the work is the work. You have to separate just because one person did not give you a free jacket. Now you want to destroy their name, which is kind of what happens in fashion. It's kind of the way relationships work in the industry are just so strange. It's unbelievable. And I feel like it's kind of sad that the same people get the same amount of press like the same brands, Balenciaga, Balenciaga, Gucci, Gucci, Prada, Prada. And I get that they pay for it, but I think journalists and fashion magazines, well, before, maybe not so much now, but before they were actually seeking what's new and always trying to find the new and always being at the forefront of who are the up and coming designers, uh, who are the people coming up. And because the magazines have failed everyone, now you have people on YouTube talking about all these obscure designers and designers coming, coming up because the magazines won't even give them the light of day and they're making amazing work. It's just that the fashion circle is such a tight knit circle and they're all just praising each other in this really, really tiny click. And it's, it's, it's just a big shame. It's a damn shame that people, they're just a bit lost in fashion journalism right now. And this documentary is from the nineties. So obviously it's even worse right now, but honestly, it, just, it makes me so upset because I know people might be thinking I'm overreacting and stuff, but I'm so passionate about this industry. I feel like a lot can come of this industry if people are just in it for the right reasons, essentially. A deadline's a deadline, a scoop's a scoop. Whether you're a war journalist or a fashion journalist, though if you're the latter, like Lowry Turner of the Evening Standard, reporting on an industry which ironically is larger globally than the armaments industry, it may still be a struggle to be taken seriously. Certainly in journalism, the uh, fashion industry is the lowest form of life. My job is to be a little girly and to sort of supposedly go shopping in Paris and, you know, not do any work at all. This week, in scenes reminiscent of the Millwall versus Chelsea grudge match, the truth behind the glitter and glamour was revealed. Ah! Go out to dinner, that's what, I, that's what they think I do all day. You know, I mean, they, they honestly do believe that. 
They don't, but they don't, it's only when I, you know, talk really, when I'm really rough in the morning and uh, do they realise. But even then they just think, oh, she's obviously out at a party last night. <laughs> I actually found that quite funny. Um, I can relate to that completely. In journalism as a whole, fashion journalism is seen as sort of like a joke because people at large don't realise how deep fashion can go. They're just like, it's clothes. What's so serious about that? And it's, it's quite an interesting thing because like this person just said in the documentary, fashion is the largest industry out of what journalists write, like sports politics. Everyone wears clothes, but everyone doesn't wear or watch sports. So fashion is a, at large, it's actually larger than any other industry. But it's crazy how people think fashion is just so mindless and thoughtless. And it doesn't help with the way journalists write, I won't lie, they, they don't help our case. It's quite insane that um, this woman said her colleagues think she just goes to fashion parties all day and I don't know what, I think a lot of journalists should kind of try to read um, a lot of like fashion books and actually realise how deep some of this stuff can go. I mean, the really good fashion journalists, they incorporate everything into their writing from art history, to even politics, art movements, architecture, so many different things. It's, it's actually insane. I feel like since I got into fashion personally, I've learnt about way more things than anything else um, from an intellectual level in terms of reading philosophy and stuff because designers are inspired by Walter Benjamin and stuff like that. It's, it's honestly insane. And I think fashion never really got the respect until people like Robin Gavan started writing and winning awards that fashion critics have never won. So I think Robin is definitely waving the flag in terms of fashion journalism being taken more seriously, for sure. Well, two blue hats in a row could constitute a trend and fashion editors are nothing if not trend spotters. Though there are no verities, the fashion media deals in a never-ending series of absolutes and certainties. Trousers are in, tartan is back, tulle is to die for, brown is the new black. Everyone, designers and journalists, are like Sisyphus condemned to an eternal cycle of newness, a seasoned story which can be expressed in a few succinct phrases. I thought it was brilliantly executed and forward a softening up of the skirt. The big message for us was blue, all sorts of blues. A world, an old world romanticism pushing it forward. The white shirt came back. That's going to be a really big change this fall and looking forward to the spring. Because if tomorrow women and men don't react to trends and change the way they dress, a lot of people will be out of work. Cotton pickers in India, Chinese silkworm farmers, Italian yarn spinners, Scottish weavers, German dyers, French seamstresses, Greek, Turkish and Bengali workers sewing in sweatshops in New York, Korea, Thailand and London. And wholesalers, retailers, vendeurs, market traders and rip-off merchants the world over. Millions of livelihoods, all depending on changing trends. So this was actually a good section. This is the last section I'm going to react to. Like I said, you guys can uh, click the link in the description and watch the full video. Um, but in fashion, they do manufacture trends a lot. And this is why I have a responsibility to tell everyone that don't just buy things to keep up with the trend because that's the whole point of the fashion industry, to get you to always think of oh, my clothing is old, I need to get the new trends and get the new trends. And like they even said, so many people's jobs rely on people constantly buying into new trends. Um, but I feel like this beast that is uh, the over-commercialization of fashion has led to a lot of pollution problems. I mean, the fashion industry is the second highest polluter in the world, uh, polluting industry, sorry. Um, so. I feel like we need to start being a bit more sensible with our purchases and don't just buy things blindly because it's like in trend. Um, that being said, if something is in trend that you personally like, go for it. But don't just keep changing your wardrobe, chasing trends because the fashion industry, their whole job is to convince you to, you know, follow the trends. Um, but I think it's quite crazy that people don't 
respect fashion journalism in the world of journalism because everything that people wear for the most part unless you've reached the level where you're not just buying every trend blindly for the most part everything that those journalists that look down on fashion journalists wear it was influenced by what fashion journalists said or a magazine because fast fashion brands like H&M and Zara are they get all their influence from what high-end fashion brands are doing and what's in Vogue and all these big magazines so it's quite interesting that as they look down on the fashion journalists the very reason they're wearing what they're wearing is because of those same journalists they look down on it's quite fascinating um, but yeah let me know your thoughts on this um, I'm really interested to see what comments I get about this this should be very interesting um, but on that note uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Fashion Roadman for everyday fashion news. Um, you can also subscribe to my Patreon if you want to support the channel financially. I will greatly appreciate it. And you just get extra content by subscribing to my Patreon. Last thing I have to say is my magazine. I know it's supposed to be out soon. I'm not too sure anymore because this is the first time I've like launched the magazine. And so many things have happened that I didn't like account for. Um, so it's now a thing where it's just going to come out when it comes out. Um, but there are, my merch is on my website for sure. And you can buy that. The link um, is in the description below as well as Patreon. And yeah, stay tuned for more videos. And I look forward to reading the comments of this video.